So today I thought I'd make a little video for you all about how to survive your first snow in rural Ireland. Now, obviously I don't have this great expertise on this apart from the fact that I've lived through about 15 snows in Tipperary at the moment. You wouldn't think that Tipperary was the Aspen of Ireland, but it actually is. We get snow every single year. It comes heavy. It's consistent, maybe three times a year we might get it where we are. And it is just the most beautiful thing, hands down my favorite part of the year, when it comes to all the times of the year in Tipperary. But you have to know how to get through it. You especially have to be prepared if you're on a tight budget, if you don't have all these mod cons. And actually, to be fair, if you have a lot of mod cons, you almost need to be more prepared because every one of them run on electricity. So this little video is kind of about how myself and Jay live through the snow every year in Tipperary, how we've adapted our lives to make it a little bit easier on us. And keep in mind, we're not living in this fancy finished house. This is still very much a work in progress. There are still things that we very much still can't afford in this house. So everything is not gonna be stuff that's out of your reach. And I'll talk as well about the stuff I did in the beginning when I came here first too. So it'll give you an idea of how I upscale through the years to different solutions, but that you can maybe look at the less expensive ones for now and do them and hopefully make your snow days a little bit more comfortable in your little house. <laughs> so when it comes to living in Loch Isle, we have a couple of hurdles here that a lot of people in rural Ireland don't have that make our snow experiences just a little bit more tricky than everyone else's. First of all, we live in a valley. And what that means is we're here and we have a hill at this side of us and we have a hill at this side. And when it snows, we can't get out from where we live in a regular car until the snow melts on one of those two hills. And that's actually quite a rare scenario. Not everybody is going to have this problem. But for us, it's definitely something that causes us a little bit more trouble than other people. Also, if we've snow for more than two days, our electricity will go. And not long after that, our mobile reception will go. So these are things that we have to plan for. You guys will only plan for them, obviously, in worst case scenario. But for us, every year, without fail, this happens. But it doesn't make us love the snow any less. It doesn't make this any less our favorite time of year. You just have to know how to live with it. You have to be prepared for it. And you're going to love it just as much as we do, even with the little quirk and stuff that go with it when you live in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> so one of the first things we do when we get snow is really early in the morning of the first day, we'll go out and we'll have a little walk for maybe a mile either way from our house and see just how much snow there actually is around the community. Sometimes when you live in a really sheltered spot like we do, it can be very deceptive and you can honestly think that you're really, really snowed in. You can go into full Narnia mode, snow boots on and everything and then come outside and be like, oh, okay, maybe it's not as snowy. Maybe I actually need to get to work and I have about 10 minutes now to get into the car. You would be surprised how many times this actually happens. So go for a little walk, have a look, see how snowed in you actually are, and then make a decision as to whether this is actually one of those snow scenarios that we're talking about in this video. So this is a really great example of what I mean when I say that you need to go for a walk and see how snowed in you actually are <laughs> before you decide that you're taking a snow day. Come on and have a look at this. Okay, so let's have a look how snowed in I actually am. Flex egg lads. That's not very snowed in at all now, is it? I don't think we're getting a snow day out of this. And look to this side as well. Like if you look up as far as the bend there, you could drive on that no problem, even without a four-wheel drive. So this is what I mean when I say go for a fucking walk and see whether the road is actually blocked before you decide that you're taking a day off work or that it's going to be dangerous for you to go in. Check the roads, go for your walk first thing in the morning. <laughs> so I'm up at the bend now and look at that road. I mean, there is just no way you'd have trouble driving on that at all. And this is what I mean. Go out for your walk, check what the roads are like before you decide you're having a snow day at all. <laughs> So the next thing we do early in the morning on the first day of the snow is we charge all our devices. Now, a lot of people aren't as device heavy as we are, but we work on computers. We work online the whole time. I do a lot of social media stuff. So it's not necessarily that I want to be online and on social media, but even just actually getting physical work done, even being able to just do illustration work on my iPad and stuff makes a huge difference. Being able to work on my laptop when there's no power. The thing about losing electricity in rural Ireland is that it's quite a common thing. The guys that maintain it do their best. They get it back up as quick as they can, but it is part of life. And it's a part of life that we tend to love because it just, it's so much fun. But 
everybody's not necessarily prepared for it. And something as simple as having an iPad charge that has a book on it, or maybe being able to just potter away at some work that you've been putting on the long finger for a while, like your accounts or something. Oh God, could you imagine spending snow weather working on accounts? <laughs> yeah, so don't do that. Do something way more fun, like drawing or reading a nice book or something like that. But if you have your devices charged early in the first day, you just have that buffer that if you lose electricity, you're not totally at a loose end later on. So all the things I'm chatting about here are still very much things that I do the first morning after the snow arrives. Always with us, the electricity will go a little bit of the way into the snow. So a lot of this stuff that we do is prepping us for losing electricity and being able to kind of be a little bit comfortable moving forward over the couple of days. So another thing that I do is I'll throw a loaf of bread in the oven. So I'll make a cake of white homemade soda bread, get it into the oven and have it there so that if the electricity goes and we lose the oven for a couple of days, that at least we have fresh bread in the house. We'll just pop it up in the freezer if we're not ready to eat it straight away. But the thing you have to remember about losing electricity is that when your oven goes, it's one of the things that's very hard to replicate in some other kind of mishmash jimmied together way so like if you lose your hob because it's electric you can have a gas hob you can use your barbecue you can use a little camping stove you have lots of options but an oven isn't as simple so what you need to do is have a look at anything you want to cook in the oven that maybe you had like especially if you've got kids or something and you have maybe a cut of meat in the fridge that you were planning on roasting or something get it into the oven early in the day get it cooked up and worst case scenario you can always just carve it up and freeze it if you don't need it if the electricity stays or just prioritize it and eat it straight away so that's us our priority is always homemade bread granny malloy's fantastic recipe you cannot beat it <laughs> and we put that in we love it and we have it there then for the first morning of the snow. So this one's kind of a two part one, again, a little bit linked to the electricity. But when I started doing up the house in Loch Isle, one of the things I made sure of was that I kept one of my open fires open in the house. So when you're going along and you have your lovely little budget and you're planning all the upgrades you're going to make, if you close up all of your open fires or you fill them all with stoves and ray burns and things that run your heating system and stuff like that what actually ends up happening is when the electricity goes because there's pumps and thermostats and radiators and all hooked to those stoves you can't use them because once the electricity goes your pump stops working so what ends up happening is you have a really really nice heating system that is fully dependent on electricity and you are literally sitting in a really nicely renovated house and you can't heat it for maybe three to six days in the middle of january and this can happen three times in the year. So with that in mind, what we did was we kept one of the fireplaces open, the one in the kitchen. And on the first morning of the snow, we won't pack on the fire in the stove. So our stove in the Ingle Nook runs all of our radiators. If we pack that on for that day and we kept it really, really hot like we normally would, if the electricity magically went to two o'clock in the afternoon, you have a stove that is reddened in the sitting room and all of your radiators are running off it. And all of a sudden, the little pump that runs the water around just totally switches off and everything's going and it sounds terrible and it's very scary. And luckily, I have a plumber in the house, so he knows what to do and how to get the fire put out and how to get everything cooled down. But don't put yourself in that situation if you don't have somebody in the house that you don't know what they're doing. Really, all you need to do is just have the fires on very, very low until you're sure that you're past the worst of this. Don't keep them on too high and light your open fires. Get your open fires going, redden them out of it and get them really, really hot. And then when it comes to the evening times, when the electricity goes, you can just, everyone can just decant into the kitchen, pull a two-seater in if you need to, or just sit on kitchen chairs and drink tea and marvel at how lovely an open fire still is to have in your house and the fact that it was free and it was already there in the first place and everyone wanted you to take it out and you didn't listen to them and now you have an open fire and your family is warm in the middle of January in your little cottage. So one of the things that we didn't have during our few first snows was we had no kind of an alternative to our electric hob when it came to cooking dinners and stuff like that. So as soon as the electricity went, we really didn't have any way of making food. And that's one of those things that I kind of wish I had known back in the beginning. Get a little gas hob for your kitchen, maybe get a little camping stove. You know, the little ones that come into like Aldi and stuff and they're less than 20 euro and you get the little blue bottles of gas with them. 
just get one of them and leave it in your, your utility room, leave it in the back of a press somewhere. And you just know that you have the option there to heat water, to have a cup of tea, have a cup of coffee, make soup, things like that. Like it just makes such a difference to have something warm in your belly when the electricity goes. Now, I'm gonna tell you what we did in the beginning because this is prime example that you don't need to have a gas hob or anything like that to survive and to have a bit of fun. What we did the first time was we had an open fire in one of the rooms and we got it really, really hot and we had just like coal embers in it and we would just sit our teapot full of water into it and we'd boil it up and we'd make tea and coffee out of it. Or we had one saucepan that was like one of those really heavy, you know, they're kind of like the Le Creuset ones, but obviously wasn't. It was one I'd bought in a car boot sale one time and it wasn't that pretty looking, but it was functional. And I was willing to kind of let it get stained up. And I remember we put that into the fire and we made one pot dinners, we made stew, we made nor soup, things like that. And it just kept us going. It was a bit of fun. We were just so inventive trying to figure out things that we could cook. And I swear, by the sixth day that year of the snow, we were out in the yard cooking meat on a barbecue because we needed to cook meat and we couldn't do it on the fire. We didn't think we'd be safe enough, you know, getting a decent cook on it. And we knew we had coals on of our barbecue left over for the summer so we're standing out at the front of the house barbecuing up meat because the freezer had already been plugged out for six days so we had to get meat and stuff like that eaten and that of course was the day that the car started coming back up the road again and the postman drives up and drops us off our week's post and we're barbecuing in the snow in Tipperary it was priceless, but it just goes to show that you don't need everything. You don't need a gas hob. You don't need the kind of stuff that we have now. But we moved from that fire and using that for maybe two or three years. And then we got to a stage that we had a little camping stove. And then when we ended up doing up the kitchen, we have our electric hob and we have a little touring gas hob in beside it because we know how important it is to have that type of a cooking method when the snow comes. So have some way of cooking, get gas in, get some sort of a little camping stove, even just get barbecue coals and just have all the fun of it. Maybe have a little campfire outside and cook on it. I mean, this kind of stuff is quite trendy now. Kids will love it, husbands love it. So it's just so much fun and you're all just gonna have a blast and the memories it's gonna make is just gonna be the most precious stuff in the whole world. <laughs> okay, I felt like this was a fantastic idea to come out in the snow and do this video for you guys but I am freezing my proverbials off at the moment my hand is so cold holding my phone the one day I wouldn't bring a tripod with me this is just so typical the next thing I want to talk to you about is having a little stash of food put away for when it snows now not everyone can do this I know for sure we couldn't when we were down here first because we were so broke but you have to think about your mammy. I mean, God, aren't Irish mammies? They're like them doomsday preppers in America. It's like my mother is still there going, do you remember the snow in 82, the big snow? Well, that won't happen to me again. I won't be stuck. I have stuff in the back of the press. And I just think it's so funny. You need to think of these Irish mammies and think of all the stuff that they have in the back of the press. I swear my mother is never without a packet of soup in our house in case a massive snow comes again and we're all less than a year old and she has to mind us and she doesn't know what to do but like they got through it they went through this stuff that we're kind of going through now out of necessity as well and you need to learn from them so they keep certain little non-perishables in the house they keep stuff in the back of presses even just having some coal or some sticks or stuff in the back of the shed even if you've oil heating but you have your one open fire then keep that stuff in the back of the shed keep enough for a week or so and don't feckin use it keep it there don't go genie i'd really love a packet of that soup now today <laughs> just buy a packet of soup if you want it listen to my mammy and keep the stuff in the back of the press because you never know when you're going to get a one week snow or a two week snow and us in rural ireland are always the last people that get pulled out of it and get our roads gritted and get our roads cleared so you need to be able to fend for yourself and you need to be able to protect the people that you're living with and keep everyone safe and fed and watered and sure then you'll be fine so one other thing that we tend to lose a lot in the snow is our mobile phone coverage usually we lose our electricity probably on the second day and within a couple of hours of that 
we lose the phone coverage and I always am cursing them going could they not get a generator I mean are they really plugged into the same grid that we're plugged into but they must be so what I normally do is I'll get out for my walk especially you know that walk I was talking about that we do first thing in the morning go out for that bring your phone with you it might necessarily be the first day but even the second day and have a look and see how far you have to go before you actually get phone coverage. Now for me, it's only about a mile from my house on one side. When I go up to the top of the hill, for some reason the mast I'm using switches to a different one. And once I get there, I'm fine. It's something I realised one time we had a storm and we had no mobile, we had no electricity. and But because it wasn't the snow, we were able to get into the car and just go for a drive and see how far we needed to go before we could get phone coverage just to let people know we were okay. So it's no harm if it snows and you lose your phone coverage to get out there and try and get to like high ground somewhere in your car and just see... It's a really great thing actually to test this in the summer because you're probably not going to be able to get your car out in the winter. So test it in the summer or during that time, you know, after maybe the day or two after a storm when a lot of the debris has been cleared up off the roads but the electricity and all still isn't back check where your phone switches to a new mast and then you're going to know at least that you can get out and get in touch with your family back home let everyone know you're safe and that you're just living the high life in narnia for a couple of days <laughs> So the last thing I want to talk to you guys about that we used to do in the snow in the beginning was we used to park our car at the end of our lane if they were given really, really heavy snow, especially if we had meetings or we had things we needed to get out to. What we do is we'd park the car at the other side of one of those two hills that I was talking about earlier. And then if it snowed really, really hard, you just walked the half a mile or the mile to your car in the morning and you just drove off to work because once you got off our lane the roads are gritted the whole time everything's totally fine it's just our lane is just like this little pocket that's been lost in time but the thing is other people on the lane also park their cars down at the bottom of the lane it's totally normal they are up higher even than we are we're actually down at the bottom in the valley but there are people who are up higher as well so they leave their cars there as well and everyone just walks to their car and <laughs> brings their stuff in. I mean, we've come back before where we went to Nina shopping and it started snowing in Nina. And by the time we got back to Loch Isle, we were snowed out, fully snowed out. We were driving a little Skoda Fabia. There wasn't a hope it was getting up one of those hills. And we were sitting there. What we had to do was we had to walk home with as much as we could carry get the wheelbarrow and walk back in the snow and pick up our stuff that we'd bought in nina like our bags of coal and stuff and it just kind of got to a stage where it was just what we did it was the norm so if you live somewhere that's a little bit mountainous and you know you're going to have trouble getting out to work and you're not as lucky as us that you work from home then leave your car at the bottom of the hill and just get your snow boots on and walk down to your car and then just drive in on the safety of those gritted roads and don't be chancing the roads that are a little bit more treacherous. So I hope I've made you a little bit less anxious about your very first snow in your little cottage that you're going to renovate. The thing you have to remember is that I did this with a lot less than what you guys probably have starting out right now. Our parents have done this with a lot less than all of us had. It's not that difficult to do it. I think you just need to get outside your comfort zone a little bit and remember that this kind of stuff is fun. Learning how to live a little bit outside of your comfort zone is fun. Learning how to cook on an open fire, learning how to just survive without all of the trappings that we have every single day in life. It is just our absolute favourite time of the year. So I'm going to go home now and thaw out my fingers because I'm absolutely frozen. I really hope you guys have enjoyed this video. It's a little bit different than what I normally do, but I think this was the time to make the video about how to survive in the snow in rural Ireland. So if you like it, don't forget to give it a really big thumbs up. Don't forget that there's a little notification bell on the feed. And what that does is it just tells you when I put up a new video so you can check back in and have a look and don't forget to subscribe because I absolutely love all of my subscribers if you guys didn't do this I wouldn't get to do what I do for a living and it's just the best one in the world so thank you all and I hope you're all totally snowed in right now and that your electricity is going to go in about 10 minutes so you can start having fun